sitting here in the office of Alden Christogen. Alden is a principal program manager in Microsoft Clustering. I hope I'm right. Yes. I am, okay. <laughs> and uh, Alden was so nice to talk to me, or is so nice to talk to me a little bit about the new things in failover clustering, the great work you have done that is in uh, the technical preview. Uh, mm -hmm. And so what is it, Alden? What are the new things you have done in the technical technical preview of uh, the next operating system that is coming somewhere in the future? <laughs> so the first thing is that we really wanted to enable, so we, we've started crunching out OS releases faster and faster. Yeah. So it, it's every you know 12 to 18 months now we've been punching out releases for the last couple of releases. And with this, it's been, you know, in the past we had a, a, a way of doing upgrades that you had to do this migration. So you'd set up one cluster, yeah. you have another cluster, you have to move across between them. It was, and it was, it was painful. But that kind it of was possible, but it was not the nicest way to doing this. It things. wasn't the nicest way. And it was actually bearable when we were doing releases every three years. Because, yeah. you know, every three years you deploy, hardware lifecycle would run out, and then three years later you would upgrade the hardware yeah. and you would deploy a new OS and you'd move from one to the other and everything seemed yeah. okay. But for the most part, you never once deployed something, you never upgrade the OS, yeah. and, and for the most part. So now that we're, we're, moving, we're moving at this faster cadence and this, and this velocity, we need to enable people to help keep up with us. Yeah. Um, and so what we knew that we had to improve our upgrade store and we mm -hmm. had to make it easier and more seamless and simple to get to the next version and keep up. Because people want to keep up because there's all this new cool innovation coming. Yeah. So you expect that people now, when they buy hardware, it's not only the, the operating system they first install on, on the hardware, they will also maybe do an upgrade to a next version, maybe a next version on this, yeah. this hardware. Because of the new cadence, you call it, yep. there will be great new features and they want to have them. Yes. So and how is, is it working now? Uh, in the past there was draining one host out of the cluster, installing a, the new version on that host, yep. and with 2012 and 2012 R2, you could, could live migrate between the two versions. That was mm -hmm. a great feature, but what is happening now? So what's going on now is that we now support rolling upgrades, and what that means is that we support mixed OS versions in yeah. the same cluster at the same time. So imagine you have a 2012 R2 cluster. Uh, what you'll be able to do is effectively, you know, let's say you have a 16 node 2012 R2 Hyper-V cluster. Yeah. You'll drain it, which will move all those VMs off, and then what you're gonna do is reinstall the operating system on top of it, and then you'll join it back into the cluster. And you'll effectively have, you'll be able to live migrate VMs within that cluster, live migrate, fail over to the up-level node. Okay to vNext, and you also go down level, so you'll be able to live migrate, that's the new thing, is being able to live migrate down level and, and coexist in this in this mixed mode operating system. Okay, that's really cool. Uh, so you have a larger uh, upgrade window, you, you don't have to do it all in, in one weekend maybe, or? Yeah, so you'll be able to kind of roll through one at a time, yeah. so you'll, you'll evict one, upgrade it, do the next one, do the next one, and, and eventually you'll get them all upgraded to the next vNext version. Yeah. Now, we also introduced something we kind of similar to like Active Directory people are familiar with called a, a cluster functional level. Yeah. And so what, what's going to happen now is that a cluster will effectively, even though you've upgraded the operating system to the next version, we're going to operate in a down level compatibility mode. Mm -hmm. So if you all the new kind of new cool features, which we'll talk about in a minute, aren't actually turned on until you get all the nodes running vNext, yeah. and then you rev the cluster functional level, then all these new features are going to lock. So, but if you, when you are on this new level, there's no way back, huh? So yeah, that's the point of return. So you can actually upgrade all the all the nodes that can be running a down-level compatibility node. And if something's going wrong, let's say you have some driver which is causing the servers to start bug checking, yeah. they don't have an updated version for vNext, you can actually roll back. Yeah. But once you flip that big switch, you know, where you, you upgrade the cluster functional version, that's the point of no return. At that point, then your your clusters of all nodes have all flipped to the ver vNext version. You can no longer add the down level nodes back in. Yeah. As I understand, the mixed cluster is not the the target you you want. You don't want people to have a mixed cluster for a year, for example. Right. Uh, right. So there is a target time frame you have. Yeah, it's, it's a it's very much a transitionary. You're, yeah. you're exactly right. So we want people to transition through it moderately quickly. And the reason is that some features don't work in the down level mode. So yeah. for example, ddupe, if you're running it, so the way ddupe works is it actually made some changes to the on disk structure. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, have a vnext node which is optimizing the volume, it will change the on disk structures so that if you try to fail it down level, it won't work anymore. Okay. 
So what, what the kind of the compromise we've made with that is that when running in a mixed mode version, yeah. only dedupe, only optimize on the down level nodes and never optimize on an up level node. So that means that you can operate in this mixed mode version, but it's not optimized. If that makes sense, I mean, I know yeah, it's, all, of course. it's not the optimal way to run. So we very much want customers to move through it quickly. Okay. So don't stay that way forever. Don't stay there more than a month, two months. Don't do that. So yeah, but but I can do it over two weeks or sure, absolutely. Yeah? Because absolutely. if you have a sixty-four node cluster and you want to upgrade it, you <laughs> it need some time. time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and if it's Hyper-V, you have to move your load to another, to the other host, upgrade the host, and, and so on. Yeah. And you might just want to leave it. You might do. A, a lot of people might want to do half the nodes. Yeah. Let it run for a week. And then see if nodes start bug checking, right? You yeah. want to know if that that yeah. driver is going to cause some sort of compatibility problems, and you maybe let it run for a week and make sure yeah. some of those so nodes start. The customers problems. can get confidence with the new version; it, it works, and so get all the hosts to that. Cool yep. feature. Yep. Another thing uh, that's new. What what do you have in stack for us? Um, so another thing that we're working on um, is kind of a what we call storage spaces. Um, with DAS or storage spaces with uh, uh, with local storage, um, and so what that really is about is enabling taking a set of commodity servers with just those internal local hard drives, mm -hmm. and then we will actually go and we will we will create kind of a you can call it kind of a virtual SAN across all the nodes. So this is kind of the one of the really hot emerging trends you see in the industry right now. You see a lot of people doing it. Um, you see things like vSAN, for example. A lot of people are excited about what they see VMware doing with vSAN. Yeah. This is the exact solution you'll be able to take uh, with Hyper-V. You'll be able to, to create, take servers and just those local internal hard drives. No need for shared storage. Uh, no need for uh, SANs or, or shared SAS cables. Yeah. You can just take those internal hard drives and then, and then create them and we will replicate across them. Um, in 2012, you have the scale out file server with storage spaces. So you have JBoards beneath that. They are connected to more than one server. Yep. And with this new thing, you can use the storage that is built into the server. That's open great new opportunities. I, it's great, and I have to play with it. It's uh, it, and it's just the evolution. So it's not like we're. From my perspective, it's not like we're doing something huge and new and totally different. It's really just the evolution of what we started with spaces in 2012, where we had spaces with shared storage, to the 2012-2022, and now we're enabling spaces with local attached storage. Cool. This is a great feature, but you but there is more. I know there is more. What, what else? We've <laughs> um, so done a lot of work in resiliency, or to even. Uh, yep. So uh, another thing we're working on is about uh, how do we make. So in the past, we kind of assumed, you know, people are going to buy for a high availability system. They're going to buy very expensive enterprise class hardware, and it's always going to work. Yeah, it's going to be flawless. It's going to be expensive. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. Um, but as we kind of moved into the software-defined data center kind of model, we are, have to change the fundamental way we think about things, and we're assuming that people are going to be buying low-cost commodity hardware. And then through the power of software, we have to make that resilient. We have to make it resilient to network failures. We have to make it resilient to, to storage failures. Yeah. Um, so, for example, one thing we're doing is one, there's kind of two features that are coming in here. One is called um, compute resiliency. And so it's about making the nodes in the cluster resilient to transient network failures between the nodes in the cluster. So if there is a VM on one host and the network pass from this host to to is not working or the storage mm -hmm. path is not working. You can move it to another host. Yeah. So what's gonna what what's gonna or it's redirected to another host. Yeah. Well. So uh, so let's take this scenario. So you have a let's say you have a two node cluster. Yeah. And this node, there's some sort of let's say a switch reset. Your your network admin just says, you know what, I middle of the day, I'm gonna reset the switch. It'll be no big deal. Nobody will notice. Yeah. You know, or that's a failure on the switch. <laughs> or a failure on the switch. Yeah. yeah. It happens. And. Um, so in the past, what would have happened is that clustering is sending these heartbeats between the nodes. So once a second, we were going, are you there? And you go, yeah, I'm here. And then we go, are you there? And you go, I'm here. So once a second, but if we drop five heartbeats, we're going, hello, hello, I can't talk to you. Then what we do is we would say, oh, we can't talk to them. There's something wrong with them. And we would kick them out of the cluster. We'd fail over those virtual machines. They would, you know, we would effectively hard, cold start them on the other nodes. It's very disruptive. Yeah. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're really optimizing more towards transient failure. So if we can't talk to you, like, hello, hello, 
we're going to give you some time. We're going to go, okay, the last time I talked to you, your VMs were running, so we're going to give you a little time, and we're going to let you basically run in what we call an isolated mode, yeah. where you will be able to be removed from the cluster, but we will assume that your VMs are still running before yeah. we take corrective action. So we'll give you a couple minutes, like four minutes, to, to you know, for like the time for the switch to reset, to come back up, and then see if you can come back into the cluster. Yeah, okay. All right, and uh, nowadays, if these five uh, seconds are over, this five heartbeats, this host will be declared dead. Mm -hmm. So the VMs will be started on another cluster host. Yep. And now they can run because the switch restarted, that, that happened, and the VMs were still running. So, um, af but after four minutes, uh, that this uh, after time frame, there will happen something else. So, uh, we'll, so basically we're giving the nodes more time. So we'll give yeah. them the four minutes and we'll assume that there's some sort of transient failure yeah. and we're going to it, it will recover. And then it will recover and it will come back in. So we're optimizing for that. Now, if four minutes goes by, then we will actually go into the behavior we have today. We're saying we haven't, it's, we've given you four full minutes. You haven't come back. We don't know what's going on with you. So now we're going to take corrective action. We're going to we're going to shoot you. We're going to kick you out of the cluster. Yeah. And we're going to fail those VMs over and take recovery action. Okay, cool. That that uh, this this uh, kind of errors happen. I have seen switch restarts yes. myself. Yep. And it's kind of a problem if <laughs> your network is not working between the host and you. Uh, the host even have maybe a problem with have I an, uh, a majority or not? Can I talk and so on? Yep. So this yep. feature is called cool what you're doing there. Is there something else? So we're also doing it on the storage layer. So the one thing we're doing is compute resiliency, which is about networking, kind of this okay. east-west. And then we're also going to do it north-south for storage. So what we're going to do there is that um, you know, we always it goes back to that we assume storage would always be working. IOs are always going to get through, and uh, in an ideal SANs are yeah. flawless, Maybe. right? <laughs> and <laughs> and I think everybody would say that uh, they've seen otherwise at times. I have seen other things. Yeah. So what we're going to do is that we're going to also optimize virtual machines for storage around transient failure. So um, in the event that let's say, so what happens today? So today, if a VM can't get its IO through, we have some IO timeouts, and if let's say IO doesn't get through for like 60 seconds. The VM is actually going to bug check and crash and fail over. Um, so we're trying to be uh, a little more forgiving. So what's going to happen now is that if we notice that IOs aren't getting through, we're actually going to freeze the VM. Mm -hmm. And then what we'll do is we'll, by freezing the VM, we're going to retain all the session state in memory on the machine. And then, and then we will try to get the storage going, access back underneath, and we'll be checking and checking and checking. And as soon as it comes back, then we will thaw the VM and let it move forward. So if you have a workload in there, maybe in a SQL server, mm -hmm. a bug check is not the ideal thing because every, every state of this server is gone. Anything but a bug check is your favorite. Anything is better than a bug check, right? Yeah. And maybe if you have only 30 seconds of, or two minutes of an, a transient yep. error, the, the safe state is there, the, the, the VM will, will reconnect to the storage and everything is going smoothly from there. Yep. Maybe there are some timeouts on the clients, but your server is still there and the, the data is still there. Yeah, and, and there's a couple different things. So most, so if it happens within 20 seconds, TCP, will, TCP reconnects when they get seamless. So there's yep. one thing. But most applications have retry logic built yep. into it. Yep. So even if your SQL server goes dark for 60 seconds and then comes back, but you didn't crash SQL, you didn't lose any of the in-state memory, and VM is just in the, and then it's just thawed and come back, most apps have reconnect logic. They'll just reconnect, and from a client perspective, it's seamless. You know, things yeah. did go dark for a little bit, but then they come back and they catch up, and things are fine. So great feature. Yeah. Something else you want to talk about, or do we have all for today? Uh, so there's one more to talk about that's interesting. Okay. Um, uh, there's a lot of more interesting. Actually, there's a I whole lot more interesting. We could go on for sometimes. We go for hours. We could, you, you are a busy man, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to talk to you now. So uh, so another thing that we're doing, which is pretty interesting, is around what we call cloud witness. Um, and so what? Okay, so let me take a step back in the story. So. Um, today we have people which are stretching clusters. So let's say you're setting up a SQL always on availability group. You're yeah. stretching these nodes across sites from New York to New Jersey or across two data centers. Two data centers. Yeah. Um, and today, if if you want to get an any stretch cluster, you want to have automatic failover. Our guidance today is that you need to put a witness, usually a file share witness, off in a third location. Yeah. Um, yeah and we so have, you need a third data center. Yeah. To, yeah. It's a little. You got three data centers. Do you have three data centers? No. 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 <laughs> Not. Most of, the, most, most of the customers I have don't have three data centers, and I work a lot of in the uh, service provider area. Two they have mostly, but a third and only for a witness. No, <laughs> so you have a solution for that. Too expensive. Yeah. So, 
So what, what they're um, so now you'll be able to use Azure as a witness. Yeah, so it's a data center. It's as a data awesome. center. So it'll be you know up in the cloud, you'll have Azure Blob Storage, and it effectively works exactly the same as a file share witness, but you're just going and using Azure. Yeah, and it's using HTTPS, so it's it goes over the internet. You don't need um, to set up any special Azure networking or anything, you can just use, uh, you can now use the cloud as a witness for your cluster. Yeah. And uh, I'm from Germany. There is a lot of uh, angst, I think the word is also angst, of sure. fear yes. uh, about data in the cloud. But uh, the people have to know in, on a file share witness, it's not the same as on a disk witness. So actually, there's not many information there about the machines. Yeah, no, that's really so. Um, on a disk witness, we store a copy of the cluster database. Yeah. So you could, you know, you could. Uh, which VM is running where? Which state is had? Uh, yeah, the, the, you, you, your angst, and it has the resources and some information about the resources. But what we're sticking up in the cloud on an Azure Blob storage is just a sequence number. It's simply just a yeah. uh, an incremental sequence number, which is updating so that we know. And basically, the way it works, if you want, I'll give you the the, <laughs> the short little detail. So um, what happens is that when the nodes are up and synchronized, in the nodes in the cluster. They'll have a sequence number, and they'll know sequence number one, sequence number one, sequence number one. So they all everything are okay. Yeah. Everything's okay. So then what happens is that kind of the scenario here is that if this node powers down, and this node doesn't update, now his sequence number will update to two, and he will update the sequence number in the cloud to two. And then if you power this node down, and then when you go power him back up, he's at one. He's at one. So he's going to go. I have one. He will then go talk to the cloud. Okay, and go, there's something. Else, well, yeah. the, the newer status, so I don't come up with a VM. Yeah, the, like the state has changed while I was down, and then he knows he's not to start. So the data that's stored up in the cloud is just a small little sequence number, it, no personal information, yeah. nothing about the configuration of the cluster, nothing at all. Great solution. I, I like it a lot, and uh, Azure is always up, so. Uh, or, <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> and, and at the end of the day, it's just a vote. So yeah. now with kind of dynamic witness and dynamic quorum, it's just a vote. And even if Azure drops off, or it doesn't matter. The cluster is still going to keep running. Yeah, yeah. So. Thank you a lot for this interview. Great stuff is coming there and it's already available in the technical preview. So people can already play with it and uh, uh, get their own experience around it. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next release of uh, Windows Server, whatever the name is. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I, we, know, I know. we know for sure next year, sometimes next year, we have the whole of it and not only the technical preview. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you.